Uh, thank you guys for being here. We're at six, seven o'clock. Boss Fist, the panel continues with our very own Sandra Stoller. Thank you for being here. Uh, can you guys hear us okay, or should we use these mics? Should we use them? No. It's better without the mic. Okay. <laughs> just checking. All right, but I figured we'd just start with you telling us um, a bit about yourself and how you got your career in um, rocket science. Okay. Well, uh, as um, Kristen said, my name is Sandy Stoller. I am a uh, longtime, in fact, a lifelong resident of the San Fernando Valley. I've been here all my life. <laughs> Went to uh, school at Cal State Northridge. Um, I think I started one semester after they changed the name from San Fernando Valley State College to Cal State Northridge. <laughs> <laughs> and I was one of the first women in the band there. Yay! <laughs> Yay. <laughs> Um, I did go to engineering school there. I have a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering, um, which I have used at the company that I'm working for for the last 40 years or so. Uh, in October, it'll be my 40th anniversary awesome. with the company. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, I, um, for the last 20 years or so, I've been working as a systems engineer and most people think of a systems engineer as someone who's involved with software. I am not. Um, we have um, a fairly robust systems engineering department, and our primary objective is to make sure that whatever system we're working with is fully integrated um, and in compliance with all of our requirements and uh, rules, regs, yeah. Uh, government um, uh, rules, so forth. Um, so, but there I, is a part that is like um, computer based. We well, we do we do use computers for everything, and yeah. in fact, we're bringing that technology in. Um, and this is something that I've been kind of an early adopter of. There. Um, called model-based systems engineering, which is a much more efficient way of doing the systems engineering work that we've been doing for years, manually with documents. Okay. Just sort of integrates everything together. Yeah. And um, and so we have we started out as a little ragtag group, lunchtime group on our own nickel. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, and several of us, you know, had heard about this technology and thought, wow, this sounds like a really interesting idea. So we went to a couple of uh, conferences and found out that, yeah, this is really good. So, um, and we eventually got to a point where the company was willing to fund it a little bit, a yeah. tiny little bit at first. <laughs> uh, but once we convince uh, <laughs> the powers that be that it is really, um, you know, it's not only a cost savings, but it improves the quality of the product that you put in. Cool. You know, they were really good. How does it improve the quality and lower the cost? Well, it usually, like, to improve the quality, first, let's talk about yeah. that, because that's really the more important thing. Well, yeah. at least in my book, that's the more important thing. <laughs> quality. You need um, a <laughs> and that is, it puts all of your data in one central location. So yeah. instead of having 25 different documents authored by 25 different authors, and they may or may not be consistent either mm -hmm. internally or amongst each other. Yeah. Now you have the data in a database yeah. one time where it can get utilized by as many documents or disciplines as, as need to use it. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, so you gain a lot of efficiency by doing that. You don't have duplication of effort and yeah. you know, things like that. Um, and the way it improves cost is you have less rework. Yeah. So a lot of times when you're dealing with a lot of different documents, uh, you know, you'll discover that two or more are not consistent. Yeah. So now you have to go through the whole process of changing them, mm -hmm. uh, you know, getting them vetted properly before you can change them and all that. So you yeah. so have the most reliable information. Yes, exactly. Okay. And and now it's getting to a point where the government is adopting a lot of this kind of technology. Okay. And so uh, they're just tickle pink that we're that we're doing this. Cool. So. <laughs> <laughs> so the position of systems engineer is to basically collect all of this data and 
might um, collect data, but really we are the um, we are the people that make other people talk to each other. Okay, <laughs> very very essential <laughs> yes. position. Um, engineers, we tend to want to sit at our little desks with our blinders on and do our very close work. Yeah, without doing too much communication to the outside world. Yes. So if you do that, you yeah. wind up that the guy over there is designing something that this guy cannot interface with. Yeah. And so, uh, <laughs> so you got you, you'd have a problem if you were doing that. So systems engineers are very heavily involved in integration. We call the people together where we know there's an interface. We manage those interfaces to make sure that everything's going to work when you do finally put it all together. Cool. And there's usually external interfaces also with your customer's system, whatever that is. And yeah. so we manage that and make sure that we have agreements between the customer and us as to what that interface is going to look like, who's responsible for which side of the interface, and, and so on and so forth. Okay. Materials are compatible, and, you know, yeah. all that stuff. So, uh, so a lot of what we do is integration and communication, you know, making sure people are, are working together and collaborating. Uh, so and this is all for one project, the goal, creating rockets, you know, at the space station. What are some of the, like, big picture projects before we... Well, um, let's see. For many years, I worked on the International Space Station project. Um, cool. That was, I worked for 15 years on that project. Um, I actually have hardware orbiting the Earth with my fingerprints on it. Oh my goodness, that's so cool. <laughs> so I, th I thought that was pretty yeah. cool. Yeah, that's really cool. Um, so it's, it was really fun working on that. It was a little crazy because yeah. we had Congress redesigning the space station as we were going. <laughs> and, okay. and there aren't too many engineers in Congress, so you might imagine how that yeah. works out. <laughs> um, so... Um, but it was, it, it was a fascinating project. Uh, yeah. During that time, uh, one of the things that I was involved in was doing mission support because, um, as you probably know, it took many missions to put the space station together. Yeah. It flew up in about 20 or 30 different missions and then um, assembled the pieces on space, yeah. in space. So for some of those pieces, the first time they were ever assembled together was in space. So you want to no make way. pretty darn sure it's going to work before you put it up there. <laughs> why, did, why, why did that happen only in space? Why not test it on Earth? It's well, we, we did a fair amount of testing yeah. on Earth. The problem is um, you have segments that are designed and built by a lot of different organizations. Yep. And, um, and furthermore, this stuff has to work in zero gravity. There aren't a whole lot of places where you can simulate zero gravity on Earth. Yeah. There's a couple of places where you can get close, okay. but, uh, but zero gravity is a very different kind of environment. Yeah. And, and furthermore, the low Earth orbit um, environment, yeah. which is about 200 to 400 nautical miles out, which is where the space station sits, okay is a very, um, it's a very unfriendly environment. It, it's very difficult on a lot of uh, materials yeah. uh, and uh, on a lot of electronics and things like that. And one of the biggest issues that I, I never knew about this before I worked on the space station was atomic oxygen. Out at 200 nautical miles, you have O1 molecules instead of O2, you have O1 molecules. So they're oh, not, wow. so you don't have a full yeah. of oxygen molecule. That means that, that that one O1 is always trying to glom onto something. Okay. And so as a consequence, it erodes many, many materials. It erodes oh. metals, it, it, uh, it erodes polymers, it erodes lots of different kind of coating materials, okay. things like that. And the way that we found out about that is back in the, I think it was in the 90s, or it might have been the 80s, uh, NASA put up a satellite called the, um, I think it was called the LDAF satellite. <laughs> and this satellite was about the size of a school bus. Yeah. And on the satellite was mounted hundreds of different materials. Yeah. And they put it on orbit for six years. And 
I think it actually wound up staying up a little longer than six years. Yeah. But then they, they grabbed it with, yeah. with the shuttle arm, the robotic arm. They grabbed it, put it back in the shuttle payload bay, and brought it back to the ground. And they examined this thing and did some material testing. And what they discovered is that there were only about six materials that weren't eroded by the time of oxygen, <laughs> among other things. Wow. We have Oh, great. Yeah. Okay. Tom Nicolides, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly, Tom, says, Sandy, what happens when you smash a connector pin in space? Oh, not good things, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I know Tom very well. Yeah. Uh, at the time that I, I, I met him many years ago, he worked for NASA down at um, uh, the Stena Space Center. Well, I, I was yeah. working at Rocket Time. Yep. <laughs> so, now, it gets pretty ugly because if you smash a pin, uh, you know, and try to connect the connector, a pair of connectors, it's not going to go. And so you are missing connections. And you're probably not missing just the one pin, yeah. but every other one because nothing's going to fit. <laughs> So, how do you smash the pin in the first place? How does that go wrong? Well, it, it's... <laughs> It's really easy for that sort of thing to happen. Okay. <laughs> oh, no. So imagine, imagine this scenario. You are an astronaut in a big old bulky suit with yeah. a big old heavy backpack on. Yeah. Now you're in zero G, so it doesn't feel heavy when you're on okay. orbit. Yeah. But it is bulky and makes it kind of hard to move around. Yeah. Um, yes. And furthermore, you have these big old nasty gloves on that are very thick and yeah. not particularly movable right. and dexterous. Yeah. <laughs> and so you're up there, and um, like one of the things that we had to do, the, the space the space station was built in segments. Yeah. And they would take these chunks of 15 to 20,000 pounds segments, fly up in the shuttle payload bay, and then attach the yeah. next segment onto the space station until you have wow. until, <laughs> until you have a full space station. Okay. <laughs> so in order to connect those segments, not only did you have mechanical connections to make to make sure that they stay together, yeah. but you also had fluid connections and electrical connections. So one of the segments that I worked on is called the, wow. the Z1 truss. And it was basically a big cable and um, fluid junction box that that connected parts. That sounds scary. Yeah, it, it was. It was, about a, yeah. it was about a 20,000 pound junction box. Wow. So it was pretty substantial. Um, and so an astronaut in these not very dexterous gloves has to go out of the space station in this suit, yeah. this really bulky suit, um, and try to connect all this stuff yeah. by hand. And so you can smash a pin. And it's just fairly <laughs> Now we, okay. we do take we do make precautions we do take precautions to prevent that from happening, yeah. but occasionally stuff happens. Yeah, so it happens. And what do they have to do? Do we have replacement parts for the head? In, to... in some instances, there are replacement parts. Um, unfortunately, for a big primary power cable, you're going to have to go back down to Earth and get another one and bring okay. it up. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, some of these okay, are... Okay, so that section just stays yeah. in space for a, right. for a bit until you can get the next... Ex exactly. Thing. Okay. Um, so it well, that's a good question, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> Do not yes. <laughs> explode. The Alice Grove. Yes. Is how mama. Oh, <laughs> hi, baby. <laughs> <laughs> Love you. <laughs> cool. I'm so glad we're having Facebook Live yes. people join in. That's great. Um, <laughs> uh, cool. So... What are some of the other um, difficulties or challenges that you've seen or worked through in your career? Uh, oh, well, there are countless <laughs> difficulties, as you might imagine. Number one, being a woman in a primarily male yeah. field, especially when I started, because um, I actually started at Rocketdyne in uh, 1975. Cool. So um, it was a while ago. Was this right out of college? Yeah, well, actually, that was before I graduated. Nice. I started out <laughs> as, an, so cool. as an intern. Yeah, I was good. an intern for four years, um, where I worked a half a year and went to school a half a year. Yeah. Even though I was local, I just found it easier to do that 
Yeah. And so, uh, and they were willing to, you know, have have me. So uh, I got a lot of yeah. hands-on experience while I was in school, which was awesome, great. Yeah. And then uh, when I, I, I actually got hired in as an engineer. Three units short of my bachelor's degree. Nice. Because <laughs> so, I had a, you know, I had a track record yeah, with the yeah. company, and so they. But you finished to, your bachelor's but degree I did. anyway. I <laughs> did. I did finish my that's degree good. the next semester. <laughs> oh, that's great. And, uh, but in the meantime, I had an income, which yeah. was wonderful nice. at the time. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, um, so that that was very challenging. Because, yeah. And it's not because of. All, you know, not the same, not always the same kinds of things you hear in the news right now, but it's just, you know, people just didn't know what to do with us. Yeah. You know, they, we were just sort of, you know, like an elephant standing there in the room and nobody, you know, <laughs> kind of, okay, now what do we do? We're too intimidated to talk to you. Yes. <laughs> um, They're like, no, we need to communicate. I'm sorry. Yes. And so it was, it was interesting times. Okay. Um, the year I graduated, we had 22 women in our graduating class yeah. out of a class of about 300 altogether. Wow. Okay, so it was it was small. It was less than ten percent. Yeah, and uh, so so it was it was interesting, but uh, it also there were certain advantages also, and that is I could walk into any lab in the place and they would know me because <laughs> there weren't many of us there. <laughs> yeah, and so uh, and you know and I could in in some ways the. You know, the lab technicians were even a little less intimidated by having a woman in the in the place because, yeah. you know, they they thought of us as like their sisters or their wives or yeah. their mothers, um, and so I could go in and ask questions about just about anything. Yeah, and you know, get get the lowdown on something. <laughs> yeah, that's good. So they're more able to talk to you and explain right. the things. That is a big advantage. Yeah. <laughs> also, yeah, I feel like they'd be less willing to explain everything. Die. Yes. Sometimes. <laughs> or sometimes they won't like ask questions. Right. Exactly. So, and cool. so uh, one thing I learned very early on is you must ask a lot of questions. This goes for anyone getting into the engineering field. Yeah. Um, you you must walk in and just be willing to learn like crazy for yeah. those five years. You know, because yeah. that's what you're doing. It's, you're, you're learning practically that whole time. Now. Yeah. That doesn't mean you're not going to be productive for those first five years. You, you will be. I have a, um, I have a young fellow that just came to work for us with a couple of years of engineering experience. He's, yes, he's been there for about three weeks, and uh, very smart guy. And I'm thrilled to death to have him because most of us old codgers are getting ready to retire. Oh, no. <laughs> uh, so. Um, so I'm, I'm happy to see that there's some smart people coming in and yeah. going to be able to pick up the baton from, from some of us. Right. And he's doing great. I've got him, I had him dive right in. <laughs> <laughs> so. Cool. So what, so everyone, are, are you constantly learning though throughout the career? Do you have to constantly. be willing to yes. be an well, internal that, learner? What I was, you know what I was talking about earlier with the model-based systems engineering. Yeah, uh, that technology has only really been becoming widespread for the last five or six years. Okay, um, except in the software. Yeah, uh, the software people have been doing this for a bit longer, um, and so you know we have had to learn a whole bunch of new um, new applications. Yeah, uh, you know learn how to do things in a different way. And that's pretty much how it is in most areas of engineering. As time goes by, you know there are, there are advances improvements. And right. Yeah. Um, in the you know in the physics-based modeling area, there are these tremendously fast new you know optimization modeling tools now that that people are using, and they're you know they're pretty great. Yeah. What are some of the biggest like breakthroughs that have happened? Well, in our area, you know, most of the big breakthroughs are in material science. Um, as you might imagine, you know, being part of a rocket engine puts you in a really, really difficult environment. Yeah. It gets hot. 
Yeah. It shakes like hell. Uh, <laughs> it's, you know, you yeah. just all the way around. And if you're out in deep space, it gets really cold. Yeah. <laughs> so there are, um, so materials are really important. Yeah. And um, especially, you know, when you start using some of the more efficient um, propellants, you know, that they usually run pretty hot. And so you have to have materials that are, uh, that are going to stand up to that. Okay. And, uh, and also to the environments. Again, as I said, low earth orbit is not a very friendly environment. It has the atomic oxygen. It has a lot of ultraviolet radiation from the sun, but you don't have an atmosphere to filter it. Out right. there. Uh, you have uh, gamma radiation, which is the uh, you know the ionizing radiation coming from the uh, the sun yeah. and and other places out in space. But that stuff just wreaks havoc with electronics, with solid state electronics. Yeah. So um, it so there are some really you know harsh environment. So you yeah. have materials that are going to be robust and be able to deal with it. And also, as you might imagine, weight is a big issue. Yeah. So you want not only very strong materials, you want them to be very lightweight. Yeah. So <laughs> we have another question. Absolutely. It's a statement from Tom again. And Tom, forgive me, but I'm going to rephrase it slightly. Uh, rephrasing as a mechanical engineer, Sandy was not only responsible for mechanical connections on, on the space station, but also electrical. That makes her an engineer's engineer. Oh, nice. Thank you, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> I feel the same way about you. <laughs> Thank you. Very cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, a difficult thing to do. So the challenges are you have to get the materials that can withstand the harsh environment. It has to be as lightweight as possible. So how, uh, what materials have we found that best withstand? Well, I, you know, some of the materials are, are fairly common. They're, yeah. you know, various alloys of aluminum. Yeah. That aluminum still works very well. You can do things to aluminum to make it um, uh, more resistant to erosion and things yeah. like that, like coat it or anodize it and things like that. Um, of late, we've been seeing a lot more composite materials, uh, basically carbon composites. Yeah. And they're pretty nifty because they are very strong uh, and, and much lighter weight than some of the steels. Or nice. well, not so much the aluminum, but more than yeah. the steels. And um, titaniums, various alloys of titanium. And, uh, you know, one of the neat things that's happening now in the industry is uh, we're doing a lot of what we call additive manufacturing. And additive manufacturing is pretty much like 3D printed metal parts. Cool. And um, when you can do that, you can leave off the unnecessary pieces that you have to keep if you're doing conventional machining because yeah. you need places to grab onto parts and things yeah. like that. And there's much less waste with machining. You're removing material, and right. that material is waste material. Yeah. So this is all additive, and you're only adding what you need. So this is where they can take 3D printers to space and get rid of anything that they, is. They can. In fact, I think they actually have a, at least one 3D printer up on the space station cool. yeah. that they <laughs> use for you know, little parts. But, yeah. but what I'm talking about are big industrial parts. Okay. Yeah. And, and made out of metals, nice. of metals, and so that's pretty cool stuff. It's really interesting. Yeah. And so that's kind of the hottest technology right now. Yeah. Um, we also have some of our own proprietary um, alloys that I really can't tell you a whole lot about, but it's you know because it's such an important thing in our yeah. industry. Um, I actually know a woman that has an alloy named after her. I think that's cool. very cool. Yeah, that's so cool. <laughs> and. Um, so, you know, material science is really an important, yeah, an important area. Well, rocket science has been, like, huge in the news lately because of Elon Musk, right, <laughs> especially it. here in California. So how has that changed things, like, uh, again, large popular awareness now? Yeah, <laughs> it, there is, and it's, it's very different. Yeah. 
uh, as I said, I got into the business in the in the mid seventies. Yeah. So it was shortly after Apollo yeah, was so over, it was and just before the, the shuttle was getting started. Yeah. So it was just just as they were developing the shuttle. Um. So uh, having small private um, companies doing space work yeah. is a very different model than yeah. we're used to. Uh, you know, for years and years and years, it's been NASA coming to the the big five contractors. Yeah, you know, the Boeing's, the Lockheed's, yeah. the Rocketdynes of the world. Uh, we're we're now actually a, a much smaller company than we used to be, but um, uh, and contracting to get yeah. you know, this kind of work done. Now they're going to places like SpaceX <laughs> and Sierra Nevada and uh, Blue Origin up in yeah. Washington State. And um, those guys can do things in a much more streamlined fashion, and uh, and we are trying to learn from that as well. Of yeah. course, you've heard the you've heard the terms old space and new space. Uh, I'm sure. Well, we are what they call old space, yeah. and Elon is what they call new space. <laughs> that makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> um, and but there are differences in the way we do business. Yeah. And, um, you know, there are things like uh, safety that, you know, uh, really still have to be looked after. Yeah. And, so, and, and Elon kind of is using the, um, the method he used to use for many, many years, and we call it test, fail, fix. Mm -hmm. Where they'll, they'll test something, they'll yeah, have a failure, that. and then, and then yeah. they'll go fix it. They'll turn it around quickly and fix it. Yeah. And that is a really good way to develop rocket engines. Yeah. It is, it's tried and true, it works. Um, but testing, large scale rocket engine testing, yeah. is hellaciously expensive. Yeah. And so um, you have organizations like NASA and the Air Force wanting you to do less and less testing because yeah. it's so darn expensive. So we have had to develop much more robust uh, modeling techniques yeah. so that we can simulate. Yeah. How is Elon Musk able to do this kind of testing where he can get these failures? Well, he doesn't. Um, he, he does. Um, he does it on a on a very limited basis and isolated system. So he's okay. doing basically subsystem testing instead of whole big gotcha. rocket testing. Yeah. Now there is some whole big rocket testing, yeah. but um, he does a lot of subsystem testing. The other thing that he does in from what I understand is that he is fully integrated vertically, meaning that he manufactures virtually everything that goes on that rocket. Whereas a, crazy. a lot of us, yeah. we subcontract things out yeah. to, to other organizations uh, where they, you know, they have a specialty or a, mm. you know, are particularly good at a particular kind of machining or something yeah. like that. Uh, so. Um, so that's a difference between the industries. And, really it, different. and it really remains to kind of shake out and see how everything is yeah. is going to fall out of this. Uh, I wish them luck. I think it's really cool stuff that they're doing. Yeah. Um, and uh, I have a number of co workers who are former SpaceX employees. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and uh, they said it was fun to work there, but. Long, long hours. Oh yeah, they expect you to like <laughs> yes. live there. <laughs> yes, pretty much. Yes. <laughs> uh, from what I understand, they're they're figuring out that they're going to have to change that model a little bit because now they're starting to get some some people that have families and yeah. You know, so they're, they're going to have to figure out a way around around that. Fair. <laughs> and yeah. you know, we've we've managed to figure out how to how to deal with that. And yeah. There will always be times when you have to push for. You know, for a special push where you have to put in extra hours. Yeah, of course. Uh, and you know, and I have always done that willingly. Um, but I don't want to do that every week, every day. No, <laughs> no, they're so, going to get burnout. And yeah, SpaceX does work you exactly. like, like crazy to get what they're doing. But so, what are because there's a lot more competition from these private industries. What are some of the things that you are being pushed to do kind of fast? Well, we're we're being pushed to do things a lot cheaper and a lot faster. Okay. 
they want things turned around much more quickly than, yeah. than we have done in the past. Okay. Uh, and that and the they in that is usually NASA or yeah. the Air Force or one of the one of the military or just the defense agencies. Yeah. Um, so uh, so there, there's a huge push for that sort of thing, and so people are really trying to figure out how to do that. We're also trying to figure out how to do commercial space. Now, yeah. everybody's trying to figure out what does commercial space really mean. Right. Um, and, you know, the Boeing people and the lucky people will tell you, oh, we've been commercial space since the beginning of time. <laughs> <laughs> but no, they yeah, haven't quite not, been. But, yeah. <laughs> uh, because they have worked uh, almost exclusively to the NASA and military standards, okay. uh, which are, you know, in some cases, onerous. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, but... Um, so everybody's trying to figure out, well, what does commercial space mean? And we are actually, on, on one of our projects, we're in direct competition with SpaceX on the, the commercial crew program. Uh, and so there's the SpaceX version of that, and the, um, and the it's actually Boeing is the prime yeah. on that. So there are two major contractors. NASA is buying seats on both of the vehicles so yeah. that they can interchange them as they need to. So they have multiple suppliers. Which makes a lot of sense. Yeah, a lot of sense. <laughs> right. I mean, I'm sure American Airlines buys planes from both Boeing and Airbus. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so, um, <laughs> yeah. So, um, so we're kind of feeling our way through this, and I'm pretty sure that they are at SpaceX as well. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> and uh, you know, just trying to figure out how to comply with the NASA standards, you know, and still keep the cost and the and the schedule yeah. in check. And so, uh, so it's, a, it's an interesting challenge. <laughs> uh, space isn't cheap. Right, right. <laughs> so what if, because we're being, you guys are being pushed to do things faster and cheaper, there's not the same quality control. I mean, there is quality control, but it has to be done on a quicker timeline. So what happens when a disaster does happen? Like, hypothetically, we send someone space and it, it goes wrong. <laughs> is this going to be disastrous? Are we going to go back system or are we going to keep pushing the envelope and trying to... So I'll, I'll use the commercial crew program as an example Yeah, because that, that's a perfect example of this. Um, built into both of the vehicles are abort operations. Yeah. So there are um, launch abort, yeah. low orbit, Abort and high orbit aborts okay. that can be done well, under under various circumstances. Yeah, and so those are actually built into the system. Nice. In addition to that, you know, one of the one of the mainstays of the um, manned space program with NASA for years and years and years is making everything at least one fault tolerant. And what that means is you can have one thing fail and have a backup system that's going to pull going to kick in and, and take yeah. care of it. So one fault tolerance is a uh, is, is still kind of a mainstay, and NASA still has that in their standards. But, you know, one of the things that people are looking at is, are there other ways to improve reliability yeah. in the systems without having to build two of everything? So... You can look okay. another way of doing that is to is to buy highly reliable parts, for example. Yeah. If you buy parts that have a much higher reliability, you have a chance, you know, you, they're gonna they're gonna be you yeah. know, more robust. Cool. So so that's something that people are looking into. Um, NASA's still not buying it yet. <laughs> oh, <laughs> in terms of <laughs> you, know, the, you know, the the powers that be in an organization I mean, they, if they are convinced that this is necessary for safety, yeah, they are going to hang on to it. Yeah. And so that is still a debate that's going on. Uh, safety is, you know, at least from our standpoint, safety is the number one issue. Yeah. Uh, I mean, we, you know, we go to work every day knowing that uh, astronauts' lives depend yeah. on what we do every day. And so it's... it's a very important part of, of what we do. Now we've had this, you know, of course cost and schedule have always been in the mix, 
Yeah. Um, but, but, more but, you know, nothing trumps safety, if you'll excuse the terminology. <laughs> <laughs> excuse. <laughs> Sorry, <Yes>. Tom. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> um, so, but if we can get to space faster, <laughs> why do we have to be the most safe? Like, why? There are many people who would, would give their lives for this, and yes. we need to find out. Like, first of all, there are the hypothetical scenarios where we screw up Earth and we need another habitable place. You know, at least we need to get us to the moon or something yeah. to get to the next yeah. point. That's what so, by the way. So I guess if there's a disaster on Earth, will the safety, like, <laughs> be less of an issue? Well, it, it may be. Yeah. Because the situation is yeah. But, you know, when I got into the business, you know, I was, my thinking was, oh, we'll be going back to the moon in no time. Right. Well, that was about 45, 50 years ago. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. And so, uh, so it, it's been disappointing, and many of us have gotten into the business, you know, with that thought in mind. Yeah, that we can get on, yeah. on the moon, and then we try to explore more places. Right. And we have built the base. And, and we've worked in the business, you know, oh, for years and years, working on programs that said, we're going back to the moon, we're going yeah. to Mars, yeah. nothing yeah. to happen to Mars. It's terribly disappointing when something yeah. like that happens. And, and usually, honestly, the major reason for canceling them is cost. Yeah. It's very expensive. We depend on uh, congressional allocations yeah. for our funding. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, and if, if the general populace is not interested in supporting space yeah. exploration, we are not going to get funded. Yeah. Um, now, that said, the NASA budget is about one half of one percent of the U.S. budget. Yeah. So it's a relatively small piece yeah, of it as things, now. As yeah. as things go. <laughs> but. Um, and, and I think, you know, that one half of 1% is something that at least I'd be willing to fund, you know, as yeah. a taxpayer. Oh, yeah. I, I'm interested in doing that. Uh, so, and, and I'm hoping, you know, I run into people, I run into space enthusiasts everywhere that I go. Yeah. I mean, there are a lot of people out there, and sometimes we forget that there are a lot of people out there that really are interested in this stuff. Yeah. Uh, there's a few that aren't, but... You know, we, we run into a lot of people who are, so, uh, and that's gratifying. And, you know, a lot of, um, some of what we do is also community outreach, yeah. where we will go out to schools and talk to fourth and fifth graders, uh, sixth and seventh graders, you know, yeah. kids when they're just before they're making the decisions about what they want to do in life. Yeah. And so, you know, we kind of put the bug in there in the here yeah. and say, you know, I mean, engineering is a good profession. I mean, we, we really like to have some of you guys. <laughs> so, yeah, I should, you know, uh, Tom Young says that he thinks that the Air Force Space budget was bigger than NASA's. Uh, it may be. Yeah, it may well be. Uh, it's not as um, highly advertised, shall we say, <laughs> as NASA. <laughs> Other countries, do they have any competition? Do we have competition getting to the moon with China, Russia? We do. Um, China has a very active space program. Yeah. Uh, and what's kind of funny is we never hear about it. Nobody, yeah, we never hear about it. Nobody reports it. it. Yeah. I mean, it's the information is there. You know, you can't miss a rocket taking off from the face of the earth. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, uh, so it's um, yeah. That's so, so China is, has a very active okay. space program. In fact, they I believe, and Tom can correct me if I if I'm wrong about this. I believe that China may have a space station on orbit, a small one, small oh. space station on orbit. Okay, I'm not yeah, hundred, don't really I'm not hundred percent sure about that. Yeah. But um, and the other major power that has a big space program is the the Russians. The former Soviet Union yep. people um, and the Russians, you know, they were right there. I mean, it, it was sort of neck and neck between us and the Germans and the Russians when the space program was first developing. Yeah, of course. 
so uh, the Russians are still fairly active. I believe they do not spend as much on space as they used to, yeah. sort of like us, yeah. you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, <laughs> so, yes. Yeah. Okay, Tom just answered your question, uh, Sandy. He says they do, and the one that just rest. Ah, uh, yes. Uh, okay. Thanks, Tom. <laughs> do you have to, are, are you ever needing parts from another country or company in on, Russia on or occasion. China? Um, on occasion, we, we do, and, and it, it's actually more like the European Union. Yeah, okay. Where uh, the, the, the Euro European Union has a very active uh, space group. They, um, what they build is primarily unmanned uh, yeah. space craft for putting up satellites yeah. and whatnot, but they do have astronaut corps. Uh, and they and they fly. You know, when we were flying the shuttle back and forth to the station all yeah. the time, we were taking Europeans, we were taking Japanese, we yeah. were taking you know, people from all over the place, uh, Russians in, in particular, because we have a partnership with Russia on the space station project. So, um, so on occasion there is a part, you know, that can only be obtained from a foreign entity. And so uh, we, you know, we have to we have to abide by all the export laws yes. and things like that. <laughs> and there's so much paperwork involved in getting I, off. That might be harder than getting off the planet itself. And it's getting the paperwork. a tremendous <laughs> amount of paperwork, and and I experienced that firsthand because huh. on the space station program, I uh, went over to Russia. Yeah to test um, cool. some hardware yeah. before it was going to be flown up to the station. Yeah. And uh, just building up to that trip was <laughs> getting your papers in order. was an amazing feat. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so, yes. Okay, uh, Sammy, Alex wants to know, when people question the practicality of having an active space program, how do you respond? Two part question. Second part, what do you feel are some of the most important advancements the space program has fostered? Uh, good questions. Good questions. Um, you know, if, it's, if somebody is, is dead set <laughs> to, to not want to support space, chances are you're not going to be able to change their mind. Yeah. However, however uh, you know, what we do as human beings is exploration. Yeah. We have done it since the beginning of time. Uh, and, you know, space is one of the few frontiers left for us. Um, we've explored the Earth like crazy. We've yeah. explored the oceans yeah. like crazy. You know, but there's a whole universe out there that we have not explored. And, and quite frankly, space programs spawn technology. They spawn a lot of technology. Uh, during the shuttle program, we had they, NASA actually put out a booklet called uh, Spinoffs, and this booklet was about oh maybe half to three quarters of an inch thick, yeah, two sided, and every page had an invention or or a type of technology that was spun off from the shuttle program. Oh, that's awesome. And then also from uh, I believe they may have done that also on Apollo. Yeah, from the Apollo program. And uh, so there's just a ton of stuff from, you know, pens that are right upside down. Yeah. To, I mean, not just tons oh, yeah. tons of things, you know. Um, so you might imagine that the, uh, you know, the, the, the computer business has, you know, a lot has developed as a result of having to miniaturize things, yeah. for space travel and, you know, things like that. So, uh, I mean, there's just tons of them. Just if you go to NASA, I think it's nasa.gov, uh, and just type in the word uh, "spinoffs," and they'll they'll be able to they'll be able to find many of them. What was the second part of the question? Well, the first part was when people question the practicality of having an active space program, how do you respond? Well. <laughs> Yeah, that was. You're saying you can't change people's minds, but yeah, you can okay. show them and all the stuff you've done. What do you feel some of the most important advancements in the space program 
via the Tigris network, which is a an older network that you know has yeah. been in place for many, many years. Yeah. Uh, but I my, it, it's my, mostly voice call and video. Right? It's voice and video, but like, there's also data. There's a ton oh, of data that goes back and forth. Okay. Um, all the time. Yeah. To the station. Yes. There's a question over here. Well, okay. Uh, naturally, it's designed to Skype through space. It is. However, when you're on a planetary body. Uh, it goes and it reflects down the right. And therefore, since the moon doesn't have any it just goes straight and you wouldn't get so much on the other side. Unless you had a satellite. satellite. They still know how to make wire. Yeah, unless you had a satellite of const a constellation yeah. of satellites yeah. around yeah. the entire body. So. Okay, um, okay. Eli? Uh, I have a question. Okay. Yeah, that's a good question. Okay, Gravity that versus microgravity. Okay, so that is um, okay. So gravity, as everybody knows, is the force that pulls you towards the center of the body that you're standing on, yep. the Earth or the Moon or, or whatever it is, and it is a function of the mass of that object. So the Moon is about one sixth the size of the Earth. And so its gravity is about one sixth that of, of the Earth. Yeah. Um, microgravity is what they experience in low Earth orbit, and uh, it is—it's very hard to describe. Um, certainly, there is the weightlessness. You, you, you feel weightless when you were on on the space station. Um, microgravity is what. So humans were, were designed to operate in one G, <laughs> yeah. in, in one G, in a one G environment. Now you're out in space in a much um, different. Yes, you're you're traveling at seventeen thousand eight hundred miles per hour around the Earth, uh, orbiting one every hour and a half, in yeah. an orbit. Uh, and so you, it's sort of like you think of it. If you've ever been on one of those carnival rides where you go up to the top and you're simply weightless for a little while and then you come back down, that's what it's like. <laughs> so I don't know if I really answered your question. Unfortunately, I'm not. Okay. The only Oh yeah, um, there's a high probability we would not have gone to the moon had we not been competing with the Russians. Uh, I, I'm firmly convinced of that. And again, I'm not an expert on this, but uh, I think the international competition and the you know we're the good guys, they're the bad guys kind of thing, um, you know, that gets people all fired up. And it also, you know, when the citizenry is all fired up, the Congress is more willing to pay for these kinds of things. Uh, so, yeah, that's, I think it does spur that. Now, in terms of war, um, I really only know about it, uh, how it affects technology on the ground. 
and that is, you know, every war that we've ever been involved in has spawned a ton of technology. I mean, every, you know, very often the Congress is willing to fund a war effort, yeah. but not a space effort. But have we been able to use any technology that we founded from war, like nuclear weapons oh, and that kind of thing? Absolutely. In rocket science? Absolutely. I mean, so that's, about it, yeah. Space is just not like, you know, the nation doesn't care about space tech because it's just dead science or blood science. I think mean, if the two go hand in hand, the space tech is going to help with satellites, surveillance, communication, both in war times and peace. That's going to help the nation. So, if, right. you know, mm. that stuff is more important. So Eli, are you saying that we should uh, encourage the idea that we could be at war soon so we can get to space well, better? Yeah, war is a general definition of a competition to get strategic advantage. Yeah. That's true, yeah. yeah. And that's always national strategic conflict. Yeah, that's always been the case. That's a good point. I mean even when they were chucking rocks. What's, what's over our time pressure? Okay, well, we'll take one more question if anyone okay. has anything, and then we'll wrap it up so we can get our meeting started. Such a thing as a live feed from the moon. Pardon me? Is there a live feed from the moon? Or on the moon? Right now? Yeah. Sure. Sure. I would love to have one. <laughs> Yeah, uh, of course, I'm one of those people that watches NASA TV, so, you know, where, where they have a camera focused on the Earth all the time. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, but uh, I would love to see that. I don't think there's any plan to do that immediately, but um, I don't see why they couldn't. So I want to know, while we wrap this up, when do you think we could get to the moon again? Is uh, it... Possible. <laughs> yeah, I think we could get to the moon, we meaning the U.S. Yeah. Um, I think we could get to the moon in four, maybe five years, if the country had the will to do it. If we wanted to get to yes. the moon, we could get there in yes. four or five years. I mean, you, certainly the technology is there. Um, you know, the technology is 50 yeah. years old. <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> we got there before. I mean, we build, we build rocket engines that were being built in the 50s, so, you know, it's... Are we more likely to try to send someone to Mars? No. Um, I honestly think we're more likely to send someone to the moon first, yeah. or even to a geosynchronous uh, orbit, yeah. um, rather than lower orbit, because yeah. we, we really don't have anybody out the geosynchronous orbit, which right. is, you know, pretty interesting idea, pretty interesting place. Um, but um, I, I think you're going to be more likely to convince people to go to the moon than to Mars. I think okay. Mars seems like that big, you know, hairy problem yeah. to, <laughs> to most people. <laughs> Although, I mean, certainly Elon is trying to do it. We have, we have worked on Mars programs in the past, so... Yeah. Well, I'm sad the time is uh, up because we barely scratched the surface and there's so much more we can learn from you. But yes, we're going to have to wrap things up. So thank you, Sandy, okay, for coming. Yeah. I, yes. I need to make one more comment, a little, a little bit of a disclaimer here. Yeah. I probably should have said it at the very beginning. I am here as a private citizen. I am not here as a representative of Aerojet Rocket <laughs> And so everything that I have said today is strictly my personal opinion, really has nothing to do with the company or you know what the company does or represents. The reason I say that is in order to do that as a representative of the company, I would have to get clearance from the company. Of course. Well, thank you so much. That's it. We'll have to talk privately after. Thank you. Thank you. It was really fun. Yeah, it was great. Yeah, we have to get out of here because we got to start at eight. You know how prompt we are. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank you. It's time, the final frontier. Yeah. <laughs> we could have talked for another hour. Yeah, well, yeah. Well, that's <laughs> Yes. Oh,
<laughs> tell him the tell him the cool is jazz. Yeah. 